Nehemiah. I thought it would be... See how God works? I didn't know this, but when I was preparing this, I didn't know that this is Bill's, one of Bill's favorite books of the Bible. So amazing is it how God works, isn't it? You can call it coincidence, I'll call it a God incident. Amen? Amen? I'm going to read Nehemiah 1. I'm going to start at verse 1. I can't think of a better place to start. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kishlef, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Han and I, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The walls of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burnt with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, the decrees, and the laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen for my dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people whom you redeemed by your great strength, and your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was a cupbearer to the king. What I share today I've gained from 30 years of ministry for the Lord. And also, I've got to say this, from much reading, and I borrowed heavily. I know, here I am again, with a similar message to that which I've preached previously. However, I'm going to keep on and on and on till the whole church understands and begins to walk the same path. Firstly, I want to give you a quick background and overview of Nehemiah so that you can have understanding of the situation. Nearly 600 years before Christ, Jerusalem had been destroyed and the exiles were taken to Babylon. After nearly 50 years of exile, some Jews returned and rebuilt the temple. After another 70 years, a few more returned to rebuild the city with Ezra. And after another 13 years, in 445 BC, that's the time that we've been reading about now, this is when Nehemiah gets the word of how those in Jerusalem are doing. Now I need to share something about Nehemiah, about his character, which is essential for you and I as believers today. Firstly, Nehemiah had a passion for the people of Israel. And I'm going to say that you and I should have a passion for the church. Amen? Not just Trinity, we should have a passion for the church. The other thing about Nehemiah, he was a man of prayer. He also recognized God for who he was and who he is. A God who forgives sins. And Nehemiah repented of sins. 
he also reminded God of his promises and he was not slow in asking for specific help and he didn't let his position get in the way so my first question to you this morning church I'm being cheeky do you have a vision for what God wants you to do or more importantly do you want to have a vision for what God wants you to do I think there are many people within the church who think that the only people who have visions are pastors, elders and leaders. That is not true. God can use people from all walks of life and give them a vision for the future. A vision which will accomplish something for the Lord. In fact, I hope there are many people here this morning who have a vision for something. You see, vision is the ability to see what could be. To see things different and better than they currently are. Ken and I had a vision many, many years ago about Trinity Church. Of what it could be. God, without us asking each other, we both realized that God had given us the same vision. And it ended up with us changing the name of the church. And that's how Trinity Healing and Revival Center came into being. And it is coming into being. Amen. 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 We've even heard this morning some wonderful news about Roy. That all the news so far about his cancer is good. Absolutely good. We're just waiting now for the final results of the autopsy. Uh, uh, biopsy, sorry. Not autopsy. <laughs> Biopsy. Sorry, Roy. That woke you all up, didn't it? Goals, goals and visions. Now, let, let me see this. Goals and visions are very similar, but they're different. You see, they both look forward to the future, and they see things better than they currently are. Now with goals, you and I can accomplish something. But with a vision, it can only be accomplished by God. If you see the difference. You don't in yourself have the power to do it. God must be actively involved in achieving the vision. In fact, he's the one who gives it to you. God is the one who gave Nehemiah the vision to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Now I want to take a look at Nehemiah and see how he responded to God as God gave him the vision. And the first thing I want you to see is that Nehemiah had a passion for the people of Israel. He actually cared about them. He cared about how they were doing he cared about their survival. He cared about how long, how they were getting on. And when he found out that they were in trouble and disgrace, he wept. They were in a bad state. They were in a bad condition. And it caused him then to be in a bad state and condition. I believe that Nehemiah is Nehemiah's passion for the people of Israel was given by God. Have you ever had a passion for something? Have you ever seen something or someone that you knew could be different? You not only knew it would be different, it bothered you that it wasn't. Maybe you see a situation that you know in your heart could and should be different, better than it is and it bothers you that it's not I would pray that more and more Christians would have a passion for the church of Christ I'm convinced that if more of us had a passion for the church we would see the hand of God move in more and more don't ignore the burden you've, that you've got that is the beginning of God putting a vision within you. 
The beginning is vital. How we respond to the beginning will affect not only the situation, but it will provoke, profoundly affect us. We see how Nehemiah first responded. He prayed. He knew that the problem was way too big for him. So he went to the one he, he knew could take care of the situation. And he prayed about it. Now I want us to take a look at Nehemiah's prayer. I believe there are some important things that we can learn so that as we pray about something that God is burdening us with, we can pray effectively like Nehemiah. The first thing we see about Nehemiah is prayer is visionary. He's recognizing who God is. Look at Nehemiah verse 5. O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and obey his commands. I believe one of the essential elements of effective prayer is that first of all, we've got to give glory to God. Nehemiah glorifies God by recognizing who he is. Now this helps. It gives everything perspective when we pray. And it helps us to understand that we're not just reciting some words and it's an incantation. It becomes personal. And by the way, no, it's not our words that have got power. It's God who's got the power. And he, God's got the power to alter situations. And he can even alter the course of history. When we first recognize God for who he is, we cannot help but glorify him. I don't know whether you've noticed it this morning. There's an awful lot of people in here in love with Jesus this morning. And you could tell that by the way they were singing the praise you. Not just songs. They were love songs. Nehemiah recognizes God as great and awesome and he is the promise keeper. So when we pray, we need to recognize God. We need to recognize him for who he is. He's the creator. He's faithful. He's a keeper of his promises. He's great and mighty and he's powerful. When we do this, we glorify God in recognizing it. But it also puts us in the mindset of recognizing that we're praying to a God who can really help us. When you pray, start, please, start out by recognizing who God is. Now the second thing that Nehemiah did, he repented of his sins. Nehemiah 1, verses 6 and 7, I confess the sins we Israelites including myself and my father's house have committed against you. Nehemiah doesn't just give some sloppy, half-hearted confession. You know, I hear people saying sorry, and I know for a fact they're saying sorry, but they don't really mean it. No, he doesn't just leave himself in as another person, but he singles himself out because he's repenting for himself and as a leader of the nation. Church, to be used by God and to succeed in a vision that he's given to us, we've got to be clean vessels. Our prayers are hindered by sin. We need to confess and repent of our sin. John 1, verse one uh, chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Jesus purifies us from the sin that we have committed in our lives and he makes us clean. And when we're clean, God will hear and answer our prayers. Now, for our visionary prayer to be effective, you and I have got to confess our sins. 
But we need to be specific. Please, don't just sit there and say, Oh God, forgive me my sins. You need to be specific about what the sin is. Nehemiah acknowledged the wickedness of his sin and what they were. They had not obeyed the Lord's commands. And when we confess, we must be specific about what we're repenting about. Now the first thing that Nehemiah did in, in his prayer was he remembered God's promises. Verses 8 to 10. Now I'm going to tell you that God did not, God hadn't forgot his promises. He wasn't saying to Nehemiah, oh yeah, thanks for that, I nearly forgot about it. <laughs> but God does like it when we know what his promises are and count them and share them in prayer. How often have I said to you, church, if you can include scripture in your prayer, particularly if you in include a prayer, a promise in scripture in your prayer. When we do that, it means that we know God's promises. We're counting on God's promises and we're trusting in God to be true to his promise. When we know God's promises and his will, we're better able to confidently pray. Remember the promise of God in prayer and what he says in his word. And then we see Nehemiah's prayer that he's actually asking for specific help. Verse 11. If God has burdened you for something and he's given you a passion about it and you sense that you have a vision for how it could be better, than it is currently, you don't need to continue praying. Sorry, you need to continue praying. You need to be thinking about how God can use you and then ask God to do it specifically. It's no good being random in prayer. Tuesday morning people will have heard me talk about the milk train prayer. You know, anybody ever been on the milk train? I once made the mistake of going back um, to the recruits cross in the fire service. I wanted to spend more time with Barbara. So instead of catching the 8 o'clock train, I caught the 12 o'clock train. Now normally the Birmingham, it's about two hours at the most. I got off the train at up past 7 in the morning. I haven't got on it at 12 o'clock. It stopped at every station on the way up. Took a long time going nowhere. And that's how I hear a lot of prayers. <laughs> going nowhere. Just going round. Oh, I mustn't forget Aunt Sally. And I mustn't forget Aunt John. And it goes on and on. Church, if you're going to pray, be specific. <laughs> know what you want and be specific. You know, you see, what we need to realize, this prayer that we read of Nehemiah, it's come at the end of his praying. I don't know whether you're aware of this, but for at least three to four months, he's been praying and fasting and thinking, and God's been working on his heart. We need preparation. Preparation is so important, even in prayer. Nehemiah has come to the point of seeing that he is the one that needs to go to Jerusalem. He's the one that is going to rebuild the wall. But as he's thought it through, he recognized that he's got to have the king on his side. So he's praying specifically that the king will be on his side. As you pray about something that may be burdening you, that you've got a passion for, I'm asking you, church, be specific for what you want. When you sit down in prayer, know what you want. Somebody told me many years ago, I'll be sharing this at the teaching day. It's as if you've already received it. It's as if you've already got it. That's how you pray. You know what you want because you've already got it in prayer. That's faith working, isn't it? Okay? But don't just 
sit there with a wandering mind. Be specific about what you want. Yeah, but Barbara's reminding me that Yongi Chow, you heard of Yongi Chow? Well, when he first came to the Lord, he, he had a, an ex United States Army's um, tent. That was his church. Not the million that it is, half of three quarters of a million now. It was a tent with a few people in it. And he wanted transport. And we're talking in the early 50s. And Korea was in a state but then. And he started talking to God and said, Lord, I need a bike. And he kept on and on for a month and he never got a bike. Now he's getting upset. So he goes to God and said, Lord, why haven't I got my bike? And God said to him, well, when you tell me what kind of bike you want, I'll get it for you. So he started being specific. He told God the colour, the size and everything about it. He had it within a week. That's a good example, Bob. Thank you for that. Go and read, go and read Yongi's life story. He was a man of prayer. Amazing man of prayer. All right. But what I'm saying to you, be specific. Where was I? You know, how many of you know that God wants to build his church? If you look around and you see that the church needs something and there's not enough ministries, you know, I look around and I think, where are the kids? We could do with some children. We could do with a mothers and toddlers group. I know we're waiting for one there, okay. Maybe, you know, that's just a maybe. Or maybe it's teaching others to be disciples of Jesus. You know, it would glorify God and help people in his church if people were stronger in their faith and they prayed that God would establish more Bible studies and that you might lead one or two to Jesus. You see, as God leads you and as God works within you, pray specifically for what you believe that God wants you to do. That's what Nehemiah did. As he prayed, he came to the conclusion that he was the one that needed to go and that God wanted him to go. And he still prayed that God would give him favor. We need to do the same if we're going to be a people of vision. Nehemiah didn't let his position stop him either. In one 11, we read that Nehemiah was a cupbearer to the king. What's a cupbearer? Actually, the cupbearer was a pretty important job. In the day that we're talking about, the rulers didn't just get voted out of office. The king was king for life. But if they were removed from office, they were removed because they were dead. And there were those who would like to assist the king in dying. <laughs> to avoid that, the king often had what they call a cupbearer. Someone who would bring him his food and drink, but would eat and drink part of it first to make sure it was okay. If the cupbearer did not die, then the king was happy to eat his meal. Now as the king... You wouldn't want any old Tom, Dick and Harry to be in that position. You want someone who's trustworthy and you've got confidence in. And you would keep this person close to you. And this is what Nehemiah was to that king. This was an important position with many benefits to it. And in addition to it, I don't know whether you're aware, but Jerusalem was a thousand miles away. There were no airplanes in those days to jump in, all right? <laughs> Nehemiah could have had umpteen excuses for not going to rebuild the wall. In our lives, we can have things that God puts in our heart that we just continue to make excuses for. Oh, I can't do that. Oh, it ought to be somebody else doing that. Oh, it's too big for me. 
I've got other responsibilities. I'm not equipped to do that. Oh, it takes too much time. And on and on it goes with excuses. Let me tell you something. If God is placing something on your heart and you keep making excuses as to why you can't do it, eventually your heart will become cold. Cold to what the Lord is saying. And you're going to miss out. You're going to be probably going to miss out on a great and mighty work that the Lord wants to do. If the Lord is burdening you with something, I'll tell you this, he'll give you the equipment to go with it. He will equip you to do it. If God asks you to do it, he will. Let me tell you, when I came into the role here as pastor, and it's 25 years ago, I didn't want to come. That was the first thing. That was the first excuse I had, because I didn't like the church. I had a few apprehensions. My first one, I was moaning to God, "Oh Lord, I haven't got enough experience." Then there was another one, Lord. There's too much that needs to happen in the church for it to be successful. But one thing I knew and I believed in, that God was calling me to be pastor of this church. And you know, as I prayed about it, I prayed that he would just open the doors for it to happen. (laughs) Guess what? He did. You see, God is working in this church. And as we answer his call to the vision that he's given to us, he will equip us. He will strengthen us. And he will provide. And it will be right on time. God is never late. Don't just go through life without seeing what it is that God's wanting you to do. Follow it through. Prepare, get ready for it. See the vision and consider how you might be the one to be used by God to achieve it and thus bring glory and honour to him. Now there are some here who may, as they've listened to the message, may have things on your mind. Well, if you want to talk afterwards, I'm not rushing away, come and grab me, okay? If you want prayer, come and get hold of me. I just want to pray that God will strengthen us and take us to the next step that he wants to take us. So shall we join in prayer? Father God, thank you for a most wonderful morning. Thank you, Lord, that we've been able to express our love to you. Thank you for the unity of Trinity, Lord. Thank you for that oneness. But now, Lord, we, we come to you now, Lord. And many of us, Lord, are feeling that, Lord, you want to take us further up the mountain or up another level, Lord. Yeah. Father, we just want to tell you that we're ready, Lord. Lord, will you give us the vision? Will you give us the vision of where you want to take us, Lord? Will you equip us? Will you prepare us? Will you strengthen us? But above all, Lord, will you lead us? And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's praise the Lord.